This video is brought to you by Bezel Triple Three. Now in this chapter on Jesus, De Silva calls into question the historicity of the existence of Jesus. He writes, all Christians and even most non-Christians assume that Jesus was a real person. However, other than the Bible itself, there is not a shred of evidence to show that he ever lived. Now this is just plain bad research. Let me offer two pieces of evidence. There are more, but I'll limit it for time's sake. First we have Tacitus, a Roman historian who wrote in the early second century. And he writes this in his Annals, Citation 1544. Now here, Jesus and the Christians are mentioned in connection with Nero's campaign to blame the Christians for the burning of Rome in 64 AD. Tacitus writes, He falsely charged with the guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. Then there is Pliny the Younger, who was governor of Bithynia. He wrote to the Roman Emperor Trajan in 106 AD regarding the proceedings against Christians. He writes this, They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verse a hymn to Christ as to a God, and bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, not to deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. Now, I hope you can see how silly uh, De Silva's assertion is that there's not a shred of evidence outside the Bible that Jesus ever existed. Now, in this chapter, De Silva picks some really easy problems to refute. Take, for instance, when Jesus was being crucified. De Silva writes, Another problem is that just before Jesus died, he turned to the two criminals crucified with him and said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise, Luke 23. Yet according to the prophecy, Jesus would be in the tomb for three days and nights before ascending into heaven. So how could he assure the two criminals that they would be in heaven on the day he died? Now, first off, Jesus declared this to one criminal who professed faith in him at the last moment, not to both criminals. Makes you wonder how well De Silva read everything else in the Gospels. But the other point is that the Bible teaches that at death there is a separation of the body and the soul. The body of Jesus did lay in the tomb for three days, but the human soul of both Jesus and the criminal were in the presence of God at the moment of death. Resurrection is the reuniting of the body and the soul, which in Jesus' case happened three days later. Now, De Silva goes on to dredge up old, worn-out, alleged contradictions like who went to the tomb or how many angels there were at the tomb. Now, the quick and dirty answer for time's sake is that different people describing the same event will naturally focus on different aspects according to their point of view. This does not make the accounts contradictory. There are numerous solid works that handle in detail these alleged contradictions. The one that I recommend is The Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties by Gleason Archer. Now, De Silva goes on to postulate what did happen to the body of Jesus. He writes, It is quite possible that either the Jewish priests or the Romans removed Jesus' body from the tomb so that it could not become the focus of more trouble. Now think about that for a minute. Why on earth would the Jews or the Romans want to remove the body of Jesus from the tomb? 
Both of these groups wanted nothing more than to have this latest Messiah business blow over and go away. This could be easily accomplished by producing the body for all to see within the tomb, thus squashing the movement once and for all. This, as we know, did not happen. In fact, the Jews tried to pay the Roman guards to lie about the missing body. I refer you to Matthew 28, 12. We read there, When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You're to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were sleeping. De Silva also tries to question the divinity of Jesus Christ by quoting Luke 18:19, when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. To which De Silva responds, Now if Jesus was God, why would he deny that he was God? Okay, Jesus did not say he's not good. That's clear enough. He's asking the man why he is calling him good since God alone is good. The irony is that the man was speaking to God and didn't even know it. What De Silva completely misses is the mystery of the Trinity, that God is one what, you might say, as in his being, and three whos, uh, as in the persons of the Godhead, and the mystery of the two natures of Christ, fully divine and fully human. Now, the misrepresentations in De Silva's book go on and on. But I want to go back to that quote I started with. De Silva writes in the last paragraph of his little book, he writes, Fundamentalist, born-again, and evangelical Christianity poses a real threat to Buddhism. You know, first off, there's no such category as a non-born-again Christian. Secondly, the only real threat that Christianity poses to Buddhism is the declaration of truth. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Buddhism teaches four noble truths, but Christianity presents truth itself personified in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is the highest and most essential truth that you can find in the universe. A Buddhist is absolutely free to reject the free offer of truth and life that is found only in Jesus. But rejection of the truth does not make it any less true. Now, instead of the ultra-liberal and anti-Christian book suggestions that De Silva promotes at the end of his book, such as Rescuing the Bible from the Fundamentalists by John Shelby Spong of the Jesus Seminar fame, let me offer one that takes the evidence of Jesus Christ seriously. It's called The Defense Never Rests, A Lawyer's Quest for the Gospel. It's written by a lawyer by the name of Craig Parton, and it's a solid defense of the Christian faith. There's also another one I would suggest, and that is Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Baucom. This is also an incredibly solid book that gives evidence, historical evidence, to the objective truth claims of Christianity. You know, in Jude, we are called to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And if you're a Christian, I encourage you to download A.L. De Silva's A Buddhist Critique of Fundamentalist Christianity. Very interesting stuff. Now, most of his arguments are tired and worn out. They've all been uh, swiftly dealt with before. But it's good to read some of the arguments you will get from non-Christians because a lot of them are in that book. So take advantage of it that it's there and uh, use it to polish up uh, your ability to give an answer to anyone who asks about the faith that is in you that is grounded in human history.